28, 28 participants at, uh, at this uh, moment. We'll see if a few more join in, but why don't we start? So I am uh, pleased to introduce uh, Marcia, Dr. Marcia Serville Tertullian, who is going to give the presentation this morning. Marcia is originally from uh, St. Lucia, um, now living in Canada. She did her uh, master's at the Cave Hill campus of the University of West Indies, which is in uh, Barbados. And then after a couple of years, uh, she was uh, came to uh, to Trent University here in Canada to do her PhD, and part of that work was actually done in the Soufriere uh, watershed in Saint Lucia. She also did some work uh, with one of our First Nation communities here in Ontario. So uh, the title of her presentation this morning is uh, well, this morning here where we are in Canada. Um, is uh, focused on land-based sources of uh, pollution and the focus will be primarily on the work that she has done in St. Lucia uh, as part of her PhD project, but also uh, some work that she did as part of a global environmental facility uh, project from the world, funded by the World Bank. Um, and that relates to a project uh, called IWCAM, which was focused on integrated watershed management. And uh, that work was done in another watershed in St. Lucia, the Fondor uh, watershed. So uh, we're looking forward to your presentation, Marsha. And you have about 45 minutes or so. I'll um, give you a hint that you might be getting close to the end of that. And then we'll have an opportunity for uh, questions or comments for 15 minutes. I should uh, mention that uh, to all of you that if you uh, want to type in a question, you can use the chat function at the bottom of your screen and type in some uh, questions uh, for uh, Marsha to answer. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Marsha. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to share my screen. So, sorry. Can everybody see? Yeah. So thank you for joining me here this morning or this evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm looking, as Chris said, at land-based sources of pollution in Caribbean small island developing states, but I'm particularly focusing on St. Lucia. Just to give you some context here, so the Convention for the Protection and Development of the Marine Environment of the wider region, Caribbean region area, known as the Cartagena Convention, it was adopted in Cartagena, Colombia in 1983 and was entered into force in 1986. So member states were required to take action to prevent, control or reduce pollution within the convention areas. In 1994, the UNEP Regional Office for the Caribbean um, concluded an assessment of land-based sources of marine pollution in the convention area, and the resulting land-based LBS protocol was adopted to the Cartagena Convention. That was in 1999. It was entered into force in 2010. And some of the objectives for that included um, mitigating marine pollution, within the area specifically targeting sources like sources of pollution like domestic wastewater and agriculture. And this is to show you where in the Eastern Caribbean St. Lucia is located and you can see it among the islands. It's towards the east and south. Um, it has a land area of 617 kilometers squares. It has a population of roughly 180,000. And the main sources of income for the country are um, tourism and agriculture. So in St. Lucia, there are 37 watersheds and you have various like mixed land uses. And from the picture earlier, you could see the topography, what it looked like in some areas. 
Um, so you have steep top topography, steep terrain, mountainous terrain, and um, and you have various or oh, heterogeneous geology there as well. There's a combination of forest reserves, but there is a large number of or large amount proportion of privately owned lands. So these privately owned lands are proving, the management of these are proving to be challenging. And some of the resulting issues there are unsustainable farming or agricultural practices, improper waste and wastewater disposal. And this is made, this becomes a bigger problem because there is no central wastewater treatment system for the, the watersheds that, for the island. Um, and there's just a small part of the island of St. Lucia that is hooked to like a system, a, a central wastewater treatment system, but for most of the island, they're not hooked up. And that creates threats, there are threats to water quality from sedimentation, ag agrochemicals, wastewater and livestock runoff. And the map shows the two locations that I will focus on. The Frodo watershed, it's on the eastern side of St. Lucia and the Sufrec watershed is on the southern, southwestern coast. For the project in the Sufre watershed, it was part of my PhD project and where I looked at sources of microbial and chemical um, contamination in the watershed and coastal zone. And that paper was published earlier this year, one of the, yeah. So basically it's the Sufre watershed, it's known for its tourism. Um, it's, it has a UNESCO World Heritage Site. You have the pitons there. And it has a history of contamination by fecal bacteria and other pollutants in the river in the and in the marine environment. So these present a threat to tourism, to local fishery and to the marine protected area. So as part of this, research project um, in when I went down there in 2018, um, which I tried to determine the sources of microbial contamination of fecal origin in the watershed. Is it from domestic wastewater? Is it from livestock? So I used source tracking methods, um, looked at E. coli and total coliforms present, uh, looked at chemical traces of domestic wastewater, like caffeine and sucralose fluconazole, and used um, bacteria, bacteroidales, 16S rRNA molecular markers, so, so genetic markers, to see what the sources were. And I also analyzed for pesticides of agricultural origin in the watershed. So these were the some of the monitoring sites. Um, so you had sites along the Sufre River basically, and you had sites along the Sufre Bay. And there were two different types of sampling methods used. Um, we had grab samples that were just simple grab water and capture some water and test those the water in that sample. And we deployed passive samplers. And if you could see, they're stored in a cage and um, the chemicals in the water get absorbed to the solvent within those samplers. So again, here's the grab samples, what they look like and the POSIS, the Polar Organic Chemical Integrative Sampler. And the advantage of using the POSIS was that it does not require collection of large volumes of water. And we, we left them in the water for 13 days, like almost two weeks. So they reflected temporal variability of contaminant concentrations. And from that, we were able to estimate time weighted average concentrations. And these are some of the chemicals there that were collected. You see sucralose, fluconazole, caffeine. And so these are just some of them that were collected. So 
here's some of the results here. So if you look at the sites along the river, so R1, R2 area, these are usually, these are the urban sites, more urban sites. And as you go further upstream, it gets a little more rural up there. So you'd notice that caffeine and sucralose were closer to the urban sites, uh, a typical indication of, of um, domestic wastewater, the presence of domestic wastewater. So however, chemical traces were also detected higher in the watershed at R4, so in the rural parts of the watershed. And again, there are settlements up in that area as well. And then for the microbial source tracking, like I mentioned earlier, we bacteroidales, which were found in the, which are bacteria that's found in the gut of several warm-blooded animals. Um, we used through qPCR um, testing, we were able to identify the presence of back human genetic um, bacteria from human origin, bacteria from cows, bovine, and we had we were able to identify general genetic markers of bacteria. At the time of this study, host specific genetic markers were available only for, for, for a few animal species. Yeah. On this slide as well, it shows um, bacteria in the river again. And if you look at back general, were the largest fecal bacteria from sources of other than human and bovine. So the bacteria back general category are contributing to the pollution. While there were back human, back bovine, we were seeing more from other sources. So from this here, if you looked at, these were results of caffeine circulose and fulcanazole, chemical traces of wastewater in the bay. And um, chemical traces were detected at highest concentrations offshore of the town of Sufre and at B5 near one of the communities located up along the coast, a low income settlement and near a storm drain at B1. Some additional results here show that a comparison here between fecal bacteria, E. coli in the bay um, and E. coli in the river. And what we found was that there, were, there was no correlation between peaks in fecal contamination in the river and the bay. As I mentioned, I looked also at neonicotinoid insecticides, the presence there because of agricultural land use, particularly in the upper watershed. And I found here that estimated insecticide concentrations were low but still detectable at a few of the monitoring sites. And the highest concentrations were in surface waters at the urban sites in Sufria. And you can see there's a dashed line separating the, the more urban sites from the rural sites. Um, and there was also detection in the rural areas, that's the, um, R3. You can see R3 on this side for clopyanidin and for imidacloprid, there were more um, or higher concentration detected in the urban area, R1. For fungicides, they were low but detectable at a few of the monitoring sites with the highest concentrations in surface waters at the 
urban sites. So again, if you see that, look at the dashed lines and see near the urban sites, we were finding um, fungi sites there. So what are some of the key findings here? The key findings were that chemical traces of wastewater, as well as E. coli and total coliform, bacteroidal bacteria as, as bacteria as well as pesticides were present in surface waters. In the Sufria watershed, there is contamination from fecal bacteria from sources other than humans and cattle. And chemical traces of wastewater indicated two hot spots offshore of a part of the town of Sufria with low socioeconomic status. B1 and offshore of a storm drain at Hummingbird Beach. And that was B5. So while it was evident that Sufria River was contributing to fecal pollution of the Sufria Bay, there were some localized urban sources of pollution, which in fact appeared to be dominant. So what are some of the recommendations for reducing land-based sources of pollution in the Sufraya Bay? Just to let you know that some recommendations had pre been previously proposed by SEHI, Caribbean Environmental Health Institute, which is now called CARFA, um, Caribbean Public Health Agency. And some of these should, you know, the there should be action on some of the recommendations on improvements that were previously made by SEHI, which is now CARFA. So some of these include programs to improve socioeconomic status of residents in the Barons Drive part of the town of Sufre, which is the low socioeconomic area along the Sufre Bay. Um, there should be refurbishment of a public sanitary facility in that area, there should be a development of incentives to in upgrade existing septic tr treatment systems in, in the area as well. Construct stormwater retention ponds to intercept polluted runoff. And build constructed wetlands to treat stormwater, um, gray water, septic overflow and we saw a problem there earlier on with the drain at the Hummingbird Beach. And from the construction of um, wetlands, you find that could be a source of income for the communities because sometimes ornamental flowers are can be used or ornamental plants can be used and they can be sold for an income. Other recommendations include managing animal manure. And this is a picture there that I took when I went to do field work down in St. Lucia. We found that there was some, you know, livestock near the water. You find that people tie them there. So manage animal manure, protect riparian zones. There's threats from construction of new roads and homes as well upgrade septic systems, restore de uh, degraded riparian zones, um, construct re stormwater retention ponds, as I mentioned as well, pollutant retention and flood reduction during stormy events, and install fencing or barriers along the river to prevent access from animals. So this is the other watershed that I mentioned, the four-door watershed, and it was part of my master's work. And after my master's work, I continued doing work with that project. Uh, my master's was at Caribbean, sorry, Center for Environment, Center for Resource Management and Environment Studies in Barbados at UWE. And then we started working on that project in the four-door watershed. And um, that watershed is the second largest watershed in St. Lucia. It's 
experiencing tourism development, not to the extent that Sufer is, but it's it was developing there. Um, it is a water scarce area. There was problems at the time from poor water quality and soil erosion due to unsustainable land practices. So as part of the research, I collected grab samples from the river, analyzed for E. coli and enterococci bacteria, evaluated archived records like health records, um, did some interviews, questionnaires, and just observations along the river. So basically what was happening in the Florida watershed was um, if you took a walk down the river, you would notice things like the picture on the right, top right, that there were effluent discharge points from like pig farms going directly into the river. So there was no, um, any, any um, treatment for the wastewater leaving pig farms and it was going directly in the river. And this was what a visual, just what it would look like if you were taking a walk down the, 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 the river. And here are some of the results here. Um, in the map that I made, it showed that the various locations within the watershed where um, that were hot spots basically for E. coli or hot contamination hot spots. And if you look at the different colors here, you can see as well that there's varying, various types of land use throughout the watershed. That these blue circles there um, show the location of pig farms. And as you can see, the pig farms are generally located along the rivers. So what were some of the results that we were getting um, from testing the water along the rivers. And if you look at different locations within the watershed during the wet season and during the dry season, we would notice that the counts of E. coli, uh, min counts were way above the acceptable limit for recreational waters. And that would be um, 126 CFU per 100 milliliters milliliters, sorry. So like I mentioned, I did some digging into the health records with permission from the Ministry, Ministry of Health. There were two health clinics within that watershed. And um, I was able to go in there and see what sorts of illnesses between 2007 and 2009 that people were um, being diagnosed with and see whether they were water related. And while these were some that I had flagged as water related, um, these diseases may have other causes as well. And, and it shows that further research need to be done to make sure or to, to confirm or determine whether they were in fact being or related to what was being experienced in the river, the pollution, the contamination situation in the river. So what were some of the main sources of fecal pollution in the watershed? And the primary one that we found was wastewater from pig farms. And the pig, there were so many pig farms and located around the river and poorly, poor treatment systems. So, and you had as well, poorly constructed septic tanks within communities and along water pathways. So what are some of the recommendations? Basically, to, some of the recommendations were to prescribe, monitor, and enforce safe setbacks from water courses for domestic septic tanks. And this is something that the Ministry of Health in com, um, conjunction with the Ministry of Physical Development and Planning should be undertaking. Public education was a big thing. Uh, because we found 
in, through questionnaires that were distributed to a 2% sample within the watershed that people were unaware or residents were unaware of activities that were currently um, aimed at improving water quality in the Fordor River. So public education should be aimed at effects of non-compliance and to encourage people to be vigilant to report non-compliance. Uh, low, another recommendation was a low tech treatment technology, and it was piloted during the IW CAM project. You had the biogas digesters um, piloted during that time as well for the treatment of pigweeds, I should add. So another recommendation was cross sectoral collaboration, collaboration between forestry department, agriculture department, pig farmers, other farmers. So this and Ministry of Health. So there needed to be some cross sectoral collaboration to deal with those issues. Again, create riparian strips or buffers between piggeries and water sources and enforce safe setbacks at least. 20 feet from the rivers by planting fruit trees and forest trees. So that can be um, an alter alternative source of income from the, from the sale of fruits and lumber. So farmers can benefit from the sale of fruits and lumber. Another recommendation was a PES scheme, which is a payment for environmental services scheme. And one that was piloted as well during that project was an agreement between the Caribbean Agricultural Research Development Institute, CARDI. They operated a large farm downstream and they used the river water for irrigation. And there was, you know, the pig farms upstream were contributing to the pollution of that river. So they en en entered into a, an agreement to help um, build a manure treatment system for that pig farm so that they could help, no, to get, provide technical support to help build that um, so that they in, in, in turn can get better quality water for irrigation of the plants downstream or crops downstream. So basically, what are some of the environmental problems and solutions in Caribbean small island developing states with, um, based on what I observed with the work that I did in St. Lucia, some of the problems, main problems, fecal contamination and pollution from livestock, fecal contamination and pollution from domestic wastewater, sedimentation from poor land management practices, and pesticide contamination from agriculture. What are some of the solutions? Riparian buffer strips within the watershed, better treatment of domestic wastewater, retention ponds and constructed wetlands, management of waste from livestock, incentive programs, as well as monitoring and, in, and enforcement. So at this time, I invite you to ask any questions if you have, and thank you for listening to my presentation. All right, thank you, uh, Marsha. We have uh, lots of time for questions. Um, so um, if you are uh, interested in asking some questions or making uh, comments about the presentation or in general about uh, approaches to reducing land-based sources of pollution, uh, uh, feel free to ask them. I have one uh, question, which is um, in in terms of the public education component in, in both the Soufriere watershed as well as in the Fondor watershed, do you feel that there was uh, interest among the public in, you know, trying to make some improvements in terms of water quality or was there generally you know, uh, not not too much uptake in in uh, following up on those uh, recommendations. Well, for the sport of watershed, I found there was a lot of interest, and what was particularly interesting was that the farmers were reaching out because they said they did not want to be contributing 
to the pollution of the river, but they just didn't know how to do any better. So mm. you find that people wanted to do better. People wanted to learn more. Um, the Sufria watershed, when I went down there, we did not have time to do a lot of public outreach or awareness, but the Caribbean Student Environmental Alliance, Caribbean Sea, they're doing some awareness of these issues over there and people are receptive, of course, but I think they don't know the extent of the pollution problem. Or the, so I guess there needs to be more awareness or a bigger drive to get people in the know about those issues. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Marsha, I have a question for you. Um, yes. You know, many of the issues that you identified are not that dissimilar uh, from ones that you would find in agricultural locations in many parts of the world. But the big difference, I think, um, between St. Lucia and a lot of other places is the small population, permanent population base uh, compared to the uh, number of tourism uh, tourists and the, the amount of tourism that you have. You mentioned the um, payment for environmental services idea. Is there any, um, at this point, uh, any sort of feedback loop from the tourism to try to cover some of those costs? That is a good question. Not, I don't know of any from the tourism loop, but that would be, I know in terms of waste management, they're involved in, um, there's the statutory body of solid, St. Lucia solid waste management. They're involved on that side of things, but I don't know for wastewater management if they're involved in that, um, in, if they're involved there, but it would be a good idea to have the tourism on board because our island de depends a lot on tourism as a major source of income. So it would be good to have um, that sector on board as well. Uh, I guess what I was uh, wondering was, I mean, you know, in some locations uh, you pay a, a, a fee, um, for example, I know when you know when you go into the Galapagos uh, in in uh, the Pacific, you have to pay a fee as a tourist, and that part of that fee goes into environmental management. And I just wondered if there's any thoughts to doing that sort of thing in um, in Saint Lucia. Um, I think some of the hotels are doing that, but I don't think in the particular areas that I um, I was working on that this was being applied there at all. I should mention that uh, one of the ideas, well, it's not a new idea, but uh, possibly a new idea for the Caribbean is um, around uh, involving the insurance industry, certainly in reducing um, the costs of uh, of uh, recovery after flooding or hurricanes, et cetera. So to, um, it, for hotels, for instance, that are getting uh, insurance against, uh, you know, damage from hurricanes or flooding to provide incentives for reduced uh, rates um, if they institute some um, programs such as building buffer strips, et cetera to reduce the chances of uh, catastrophic, um, you know, effects from, from hurricanes or flooding. So that's an idea which is currently being considered, I guess, within the Caribbean, um, obviously following through on those with the uh, insurance companies is, is the next step. So just thought I would mention that. I don't see any chat questions. Any other comments or questions for Marsha? Or maybe in terms of the techniques that she used in the Soufrier watershed? Okay, well, if there's no further questions, um, the next presentation, uh, I believe, is by Niala Frederick next uh, Wednesday, and she will be talking about 
nature-based solutions um, for reducing impacts from uh, primarily hurricanes, talking about uh, development of, or restoration of coral reefs as well as restoration of mangrove areas. And that will be primarily related to the work that she is currently doing in uh, Grenada. Um, so uh, hopefully you'll be able to tune in for that presentation next Wednesday. Oh, there's one chat question here. Uh, from Xin Yao Ding. Uh, Hi, Marsha. Have you checked other water quality indices like COD, BOD, total nitrogen, total phosphorus, heavy metal, sulfate, etc., to look at the whole picture? Yeah, for the four-door watershed, um, I did some of that as well. So we used Lamotte test kits in the four-door watershed, and we were able to test for things like dissolve oxygen, phosphates, nitrates, and um, some other physical and chemical par um, parameters. In the Sufria watershed, I think at some point we did look at things like pH and so on, but never looked into heavy metals or um, sulfates and so on. So I guess this is something that we can do moving forward. Um, for further research within the watershed to take a better look at the bigger picture. So we're able to know even better what is happening. I should mention that in the Caribbean, um, finding uh, research dollars is difficult. <laughs> And uh, and so, so in, in many respects, uh, you know, in the Caribbean, you have to depend upon international sources of, of funding, um, for instance, such as the World Bank, etc. So, um, you know, finding ongoing sources of uh, research dollars is a is a challenge often. Would you agree with that, Marcia? <laughs> oh, certainly, certainly, it's hard to find funding. Um, but uh, we, if we make a recommendation for certain things, we can look into, you know, further research with um, organizations like um, Water Resource Management Authority and so on. All right. If there are no further uh, questions, then thank you very much, Marsha, for your uh, presentation uh, on land-based sources of pollution. And uh, hopefully uh, many of you will be able to join us for next Wednesday. Thank you.